This is Capsule on LiveInLimbo.com. My name is Sean Chen. And I am Andreas Babilakis. This is an insightful look into pop culture, movies, music, and the like. Yeah, so I'd like to quickly say that this podcast is about music, film, and pop culture, like what you said. But I admit that we've been lacking in the aspect of films of the sh- in the show. So this episode, we're going to represent film and pop culture and some philosophical and metaphysical topics as well. Cool. Uh, yeah. So, Andreas, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Um, well, yes, on the site itself, we've not been lacking in film necessarily, but on the podcast, I feel like we have been because uh, we get mostly music guests on, which I've got no problem with. But, you know, it's nice to talk about something that I've actually studied. And um, when it comes to that, you know, it's when you study something doesn't mean you're the best at it, but you'll have a vast understanding of how that of how that topic works, which is why when a film like Transcendence comes out, which we'll be talking about today, you, one's interest will peak. And then when you actually watch the film itself, well, I guess, I guess really the film is different than the actual theme of that, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, I can't help but like make comparisons to other philosophical films or films that try to dive into philosophical themes. But um, we'll get into that. So, um, yes, the film is Transcendence. It's the one starring Johnny Depp. And, um, yeah, well, first of all, how do, everyone's seen it, I, th- I believe, yeah, right? Everyone's here and returning is Aga Bahari. How is it going? Pretty good. Good to be with you guys again. So we brought you on, especially because you are, I would say, experienced and maybe an expert in the field in the uh, field of futurism and transhumanism and the like. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm uh, just generally very interested in the subject. That's great. And how did you get into this? And how did you embrace it? And how did you find out about it? Uh... I think it was uh, the next step after I I got introduced to Richard Dawkins. And um, he basically rationalized everything using science. So that was a very good uh, foundation. And then one day um, I saw a copy of uh, Ray Kurzweil, Age of uh, Spiritual Machines, in one of those uh, yard sales. And I knew the family name Kurzweil because of the Kurzweil keyboards. So like, well, this, this must be interesting. So I picked that up and that pretty much changed everything. And that was in 2008, late 2008. And so from then until now, how have you been a part of this? Um, well, I am a part of a transhumanist uh, group in Toronto. Um, and other than that, I'm very active on Twitter and I get a very interesting followers because of the tweets that I do. And all my tweets is um, regarding technology and science. And it's just something that, you know, I'm extremely passionate about. And at the same time, I think if um, there will be some other people out there like the way I was uh, six, seven years ago, which I'm sure that uh, there are, they must be interested in the subject, but they just don't know about it yet. And I can be a part of um, spreading the message, basically, it would be it would be perfect and ideal for me. Okay, and for me, quickly, I I have a broad range of interests outside of music. So one of them is this topic of futurism as well. And briefly, in university, I had the chance to be part of um, one of TVO's top lectures, Christopher DiCarlo. Um, he has he had a course called the Relationship of Natural Systems. That's how it was. That's how I was first introduced into this topic and other um, things such as the Large Hadron Collider and all of these other cool topics. So That's I've awesome. been, yeah, I've been reading a lot about this topic for the last few years. I've wrote a few uh, papers on things like evolution and stuff during college. And hey, quick note, uh, one of my cousins, he's a composer and he's going to be performing at CERN this summer. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I, that's amazing. I wanted to go, but yeah, I can't. <laughs> it's very tight. And Andreas, so quickly a little bit about you. How did you get into this topic? Or what do you know about this topic? Um, I'm probably the least experienced, I guess, out of the group here. But um, 
I've dabbled a little bit in philosophy in university, and I also studied. Um, I did this course in university where it basically combined all sorts of sciences, so biology, physics, chemistry, astronomy. And basically the whole purpose of the course was discovering how life was uh, hypothetically created on Earth and um, how it could exist in other galaxies or on other planets and um, the capabilities of well, first of all, like physical beings existing um, in different environments in the universe. And secondly, um, different ways of living through organisms or through um, uh, just biological methods and means, right? So um, just a different What was that life. course called? That's, that's it was called Life Beyond Earth, actually. Wow, that's cool. That's at York? or Yeah, it was at York. Nice. And um, it's very, it's very um, intro-friendly because... It doesn't. Well, yeah, it it can go deeper into each field if you wanted to, but it's very um, surface level at first. Uh, and obviously, you can dive more into um, but the biology or this and that. So okay. I got to learn um, all sorts of stuff, like how wormholes work, this and that. Um, how uh, how um, hypothetically life didn't exist on Earth at the very beginning, like it was inhabitable, and how places like Mars in millions of years could actually have life on it. Um, and stuff like that, yeah. So it was it was pretty cool, and yeah, like I said, I studied um, philosophy, but that was oh, we'll, was, like, we'll, we'll, we'll dabble into the philosoph the philosophical aspect of all of this. Um, so yep. since you're the film expert, um, we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about the the film part first, and then go into the actual topic of transhumanism after that. So sounds or, good. Yeah. So Transcendence, 2014, starring Johnny Depp, Morgan Freeman. Rebecca Hall. Tell us a synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's actually a really big amount of things that happen in this film. Um, but to try and put it in like the bare basics, I guess, uh, Johnny Depp's character. Um, Dr. Will Caster. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. I'm, I, I study film, but I'm not really good at remembering characters' names unless I've seen the film countless times. So, Well, he's just gonna, a doctor. Uh, yeah, he's the main star. Yeah, you might as well just be a doctor. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Johnny Depp's character is discovering all of these things. Um, there's an assassination attempt on him, and he basically gets reborn through um, technology, and he gets put onto the internet, and he starts surviving that way, which initially seems like it's a good idea, but then it kind of backfires because um, obviously there's a terrorist organization that's that's like wanting to shut this whole thing down. Um, he's getting too powerful with all the things that he can create and all the sources he can reach out to. And yeah, it becomes a bit of a cluster mess, but um, that's a short synopsis without spoiling anything though. But um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. It's imagine the ending of her, but um, a lot more catastrophic. <laughs> that's a great way to put it. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, that's a brief synopsis right there. And from here on out, just a warning to all of our listeners, there will be spoilers, lots of spoilers. <laughs> So yep. you have like three seconds. You can enjoy us next week if you want. Just, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So now spoilers will come. So yeah. Okay. Dr. Will Caster, Johnny Depp's character, is a researcher of artificial intelligence. And he's like one of the best in the world. So I guess he's kind of like a Ray Kurzweil almost. And then yeah. there's, of course, people that are against artificial intelligence and the discovery and the development of it because they believe that we are playing God. And yeah. so there's always cases like this and then they try to, and they try to kill him and then they do kill him. And then he uploads himself like what you said, or no, well his team, uh, they upload yeah, him. They save him first. Yeah. yeah. And then it goes crazy from there because in my opinion, it's not really him anymore. Once, yeah. once I don't know, I don't know how to say this, but like, once you get into to that area where you have to, where your mind and thoughts get copied, the second that copying is completed, it is not you because once you yourself wake up and look at something in a different direction, you will have experiences that that cloned version does not have 
What are your well, thoughts, Agar? Um, yeah, I, I agree completely that the moment that um, the copy is being made, you're two completely different person. But at that exact moment, uh, in the very split second, you, you're the same thing, but you start to having your own experiences. The solution to that would be a, pro- a periodic upload of the mind information into the cloud. And uh, that requires the technology that we do not have it yet. But that's one of the ideas um, which was actually uh, presented in the movie as well. Yeah. What I didn't get about the movie, and, and not about the movie, but some people don't, that did, um, mentioning that part, that he went crazy. I, I don't think that he did went crazy. I think that just um, compared to real AIs, it's nothing. The power that uh, Dr. Will Caster was um, demonstrating. Yeah, I don't and, know if he went crazy, but like he just because he's a researcher, he just wanted to expand now that he had the power, right? Yeah, exactly. Like um, you can think in different dimensions in a much, much higher speed of learning that any any human can even um, begin to imagine. So you want to do stuff. And I think he was just doing good. And um, I think it was interesting that they kind of wanted to shift it towards the religious uh, crowd to, you know, curing the blind, raising from dead. Oh, yeah. When he starts like helping the, the people, the ailment with um, the cell re- reconstruction, right? Yeah. And the ending, I think, was perfect. I don't know. Are, are we going to give that much of a spoiler? Yeah, or? We'll, go, we'll, we'll do the whole thing. We'll do the whole thing. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you something before that because you remind me of another movie that's pretty philosophical. Um, Aga, have you seen Blade Runner? Yes, of course. Me too. That's a great, great, um, an amazing movie. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's and one music, of the best. Amazing music. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, so you'll probably be familiar with this when you discover that the replicants have um have their memories built into them. So it's that's pretty much what you were getting at with with um, transcendence because that's a really good way of showing it because they're not living beings in like other like dimensions or whatever. They're actual robots that were built or androids rather. They're actual androids that were built and have these memories, but they swear that they've had these memories. And then you have like a blade runner, like um, of course, Harrison Ford come along and say, no, these aren't yours. These were implanted. I know exactly whose memories these are. So um, because they're not real, to anyone except for these people, would you consider it still real to these people? Because obviously, um, if you want to go philosophical, uh, you could say that it's all about perception and what you perceive is real is actually real. So, um, well, what, I think what it's a matter think? of I think it's a matter of consciousness, right? That if yeah. that entity is conscious, but the fact is that it doesn't really matter because what we are doing even right now is that I'm assuming that you two are conscious. You are assuming that I'm conscious and we are having a conversation as we would have with conscious people. So for me, if it acts like a human and if it's convincing that, um, basically passing the Turing test in a simple way, uh, it's, it's good enough for me because I think, um, we shouldn't really expect anything human-like because the, well, we're basically building gods. We don't know that what will happen. Um, yeah. So all these um, efforts from the people who are actually doing something, not in a destructive way, is that to make sure that we can create the safest and most function, uh, functional for human evolution process, um, AIs and robotics, and they're completely uh, related to each other. I think those, those two fields getting closer and closer. Yeah. And so, Andreas, you said, so I think the replicants in Blade Runner, they're definitely conscious and to them, they are real and I would see them as real people too. But I think what we're trying to say is, as the originators of those memories looking at the replicants, are they us still? Because I am totally different than what my replicant would be. Um, it's tough because it, oddly enough, it's kind of similar to that age old question. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around, does it make a sound? Um, the reason why that question exists is because sound is something that you pick up and it's something that you interpret in your brain. And if nobody's there to um, convert the vibrations into sound waves, then um, 
then technically does it exist or doesn't it? And it's kind of the same thing here. Well, not the same thing, but it's similar because um, with these memories, it's the it's one's interpretation, right? And if the originator is there and they're seeing these memories that this other person is having, then that's kind of different because that's like, okay, hang on a second. These are mine. These were implanted into you. And then there's a bit of an understanding, maybe not from the person who's had them implanted into them, but from the originator itself. Now, if that person isn't there, and um, the illusion is the illusion is kept alive, then that will ring true to the person. Like I remember, there's this um, study I don't know I read it a while ago where a lot of people, not even on purpose, will just believe pretty much anything you tell them. Like if you're convincing enough, if you say, "Hey, Sean, remember that time uh, you and I went to um, you and I went to like Wild Wings, we ate, hung out, and we talked about music." Now. If you if you're close enough with me and it's it rings true to something in your past, for some reason you'll instantly believe it, even though that's not a memory that you've actually had. And of course you can't just like say any lie and it will work. It's gotta be something that'll ring true to you. And because these um robots are in transcendence case, I guess, um, these technologies um that are creating these entities will ring true to the people who invented them or to the people who are used to them and used to the way that they work. Um, it's tough to tell like what's actually real and what's not because you'll have all of these different truths and all of these different um, perspectives being amalgam amalgamated into one. And um, I don't know. It's, it's really tough because if you, okay. So if the originator is not there, then it's almost virtually impossible for anyone except for the originator to be able to call bullshit on yeah, what's going, what's it, what isn't. That's true too. It, it's tough because well, you make good points there. Well, perspective is really difficult. And that's why like mental health issues are, are staggeringly confusing and just like, we still can't find like good enough methods yet because it's really, really tough when you dive into perspective. If you see a bruise, you see a bruise, but if you try and, help something else where somebody thinks that they see bruises they'll continue to see bruises because that's what they have embedded into the brains and it's really really tough to get rid of that yeah perspective is a really screwed up thing actually <laughs> um, and so this film transcendence didn't do that well according to the critics so i'll just <laughs> say off some uh, a few ratings here well i was like looking forward to this film a lot last year when i saw it uh, yeah. in the trailer form in the theaters but imdb gave it a 6.4 out of 10 rotten tomatoes gave it an 18 percent and it has a 44 percent on metacritic so Aga, that i agree with yeah so aga what did you not like first and then what did you like about transcendence what i didn't like was um some of the actings and some part of the movie and then um, uh, the whole flow of the film from the point that um, uh, she, the, uh, the main female character, she started freaking out. Mm -hmm. um, but what I liked was the subject. That I, I thought they presented it well. And what was funny that I, I went with two of my friends. One of us um, was a screenwriter. He hated it. And me and my buddy, uh, he's a programmer. We were like, well, I don't, I don't, see what's wrong with that movie but it's a matter of if you like the subject it brings up some interesting subjects and um you imagine that if the movie was coming out five years ago it probably would have been science fiction i can't really call it the science fiction now because all these are possible it's just a matter of when exactly and yeah, yeah. Rotten Tomato, eighteen percent is pretty brutal, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. I, I would go with like a forty. I think. Um, I don't know. I kind of agree with your screenwriting friend. I mean, visually, it's fantastic. Of course, you've got um, his name escapes me. You've got the cinematographer for countless Nolan movies directing here. So um, it was aesthetically really well done. And yeah, the, the acting was a bit botchy. I agree with you there. Um, some performances are all right, but. Um, I liked the topic and the theme. I don't know if they displayed it as well as as um, well. I, I I don't believe that they did as much as you liked it. Um, but then again, I'm not that knowledgeable of the topic. I guess um, 
I think they kind of wanted to compromise too that you know you need to have that dystopian side in any Hollywood futuristic yeah. story to attract people. Yeah, which is um, unfortunate. Yeah, exactly. I don't understand why you have to blow shit up for people to like <laughs> something. Exactly. But, <laughs> so I, I, I thought the acting Sorry. was iffy. I, I think all the terminology and like the actual science and like the, the labs that they showed were all spot on. I love that part. Mm-hmm. I think the acting was over the top and there was unnecessary action where it didn't have to be like what you said with all the Hollywood stuff. Yeah. I, I really like the build up when you start seeing um the a the the cloned version of Johnny Depp. Uh he starts curing people and then you start seeing like hands being grown and then I just knew like you're gonna see him come back eventually. And then mm-hmm. he comes back and then that, for me that was the moment where, where I was like, Okay, now how do you distinguish the the originator f- who died and you knew but see i i don't look at it as an originator and copy i'm looking at it as an evolution i know of that but, being. But, ah. but, but but it's not okay so this is i thought about this at nighttime which was weird okay so you know on your computer if you have like an mp3 file or like a word document for example you start working on it and then you're done for that day and then you hit copy, and then you paste it on your USB drive, and you take that with you on your laptop, and then you start working on it elsewhere. So that original copy is older and not up to date as that pasted one that, that, that you put on your USB drive. Mm-hmm. Whereas <laughs> if you just do a drag and drop, it would just be that same original file. So... When you have, when when we do get to the singularity point, which we'll go into more later, when you have the option to have your your brain's knowledge uploaded, would you rather have it copy and pasted, which is what most of the time is portrayed, or drag and dropped? Um, what I really want is to get rid of one body, a body that has no backup. Because I do believe that we are basically everything that make who we are is inside of our brain. So and wouldn't you like to just, tran- instead of uploading your brain, just find a way to just transpose your brain? Like your brain is always your brain and they just move your brain to something else? At the physical brain? Yeah. No, I definitely don't want a physical brain because the, phys- the biology has its limits. Yeah. Not that it's not evolving, but it's very slow. So yes. this whole process is basically taking control of our own evolution, but skipping but over. But aren't you jealous of, like you, Aga, physically, won't you yeah. be jealous of the Aga who's uploaded because you, the biological one, won't exist anymore? That won't yes, be Yes, of course. I will be dying of jealousy. Yeah, I know. But wouldn't you prefer to be the, the single entity that survives? Yes, in the cloud. But with, that's still uh, not, yeah, like, okay, so, yeah. But that cloud copy of you is still not you. But you see, it, at that point, and it's, it's getting very close to the whole uh, Buddhism concept, oh, yeah. that it's not really one you, it's all connected, you just have different experiences. Now, a good example for that would be, imagine internet. Internet is internet. You have a, a subjective experience because of your machine, but you can throw this machine out and buy another machine and have a complete different experience with it. But internet still is there, which you can think of it as consciousness. Yeah, um, that's a good way of putting it, actually. Yeah, so I don't really think it's it's um, it's me and you and everything, because if, even if you will go down all the way down to atomic level, you see that we, we're not even solid. And yeah. then, then, you know, what we're we experiencing, it really is the illusion uh, created by the brain. And for whatever evolutionary reason that I don't think we know yet, but we might find out at some point. Um, and I think when we get to that point, we realize that it's basically just in subjective experiences that we have. So you have all the experiences of people being stored in the cloud and you have access to all of them and you can do things that are, are just not even imaginable right now. And so if that 
that yeah. answers yeah, that, that, that answers my question. And so before we go even further into this, Andres, what would you give this film out of 10? Uh, like I was saying, I was agreeing more with, um, with what Metacritic gave. I, I, agree. I didn't like the film. It annoyed me, but an 18 is really low because it's still extremely well shot. And it's like, it's obviously got a lot of effort put into it apart from obviously giving into um, a lot of Hollywood cliches, obviously with, you know, it could have been a movie like her or being John Malkovich to bring up two Spike Jones films or whatever that just had these themes, but it didn't have to be like the end of the world. And suddenly all of these threats and everything and all these action things, like it didn't have to be that. Imagine if it was like, um, I wish it was like her, her had no explosions or any kind of thing at all. Yeah, exactly. Her yeah. hands yeah. down is the best singularity movie exactly. so far. Yeah. I love yeah it. Oh, it's brilliant. I think it's an instant classic already. It's phenomenal. Um, but if we, if we, okay, let's say you are going to have this whole end of the world thing. Have you seen um, Lars von Trier's Melancholia, either of you? Yes. I have not. I'm Sorry. a big fan of that, man. Yep, that's the end of the world, but it's done tastefully. Yes, there's a lot of heavy stuff in it still, but it's not like this fast-paced, quickly edited, you need this, you need that, and like this huge chaotic thing. When the world ends, it just ends. That that That's kind of it. It just happens. You know it's going to happen. And that's pretty much it. It's about the, the experiences of the people, how they are with one another how they are in this situation it's just so much more poetic and different and you can get that with a film like transcendence but they didn't go that route instead they made it you know they gave into that kind of stuff and well first of all that was annoying secondly i do like the themes i do like what i was trying to say because it still taught me a little bit but it was very surface level i feel mm. like if, if it didn't give into all this action stuff it could have actually dove deeper like what I agree with Aka because her was different. Her, you saw a little bit, and it went deeper, and it went deeper, and it went deeper. And by the end, it's like you've discovered this whole new perspective of how these things work. With transcendence, you kind of get that instantly. You get, okay, he's he's moving, he's moving, he's going into this, he's going into that. And you understand. Like like you said, you were like, okay, I know he's going to come back in physical form. And he did. It's like you knew it was going to happen. Look with her, it's I did I didn't even take into account that she's well her spoilers for about thirty seconds. I didn't even take into account that she was going to be talking to all of these people, and it's like of course she is. She's mm -hmm. not even real, or she's she is real. Well, we talked about it that already, but yeah. um, she's got all this access to all these people who have the, their AIs built to be her. It's it's impossible. It's and. It's so obvious, but at the same time, I didn't think about it. But transcendence, you know, it's very by the numbers philosophically. And you'll find a lot of films are because a lot of filmmakers will dabble into philosophy, but they won't take it far enough to actually make it more than just like a textbook kind of example. It's, yeah. it's unfortunate. It was a wasted opportunity. It looks pretty sweet, though. Yeah, I would give transcendence maybe a 55 percent out of yeah 55 percent i i like the topic i did not like the execution and they could have definitely not have all that hollywood stuff going on they definitely compromised to make it mainstream and they brought a guy like johnny depp on it as well he they brought I, a lot of people yeah, on they, actually they brought a lot of mainstream people on and so i read one article where it said outside of the u.s people actually like this film but in the u.s they don't because a lot of americans don't like the idea of playing god that that sort of topic oh yeah Religion. so they could have this film could have been so good and been very human like her her is um like a transhumanism kind of film too but it was still yeah. very human this one, they made every attempt to separate the human from technology. Mm -hmm. Can I put, yeah, my, can yeah. I put in my two plugs actually quickly? Or? Yeah, sure. Two mm -hmm. excellent films that also deal with kind of like not necessarily just transhumanism, but just perspective of being. Um, again, I brought up Being John Malkovich, which is very tastefully done. I won't go into this too much. Um, it's very tastefully done because it's how this person who's pretty much got like a low life and it is kind of like not liked by a lot of people gets a chance to be, you know, the actual John Malkovich and how it goes from him just being jealous and wanting to be this person 
to him discovering how life works as a whole and is this really you as a person if it's not your actual experiences but the ones you're controlling for somebody else it's it's very poetic it doesn't give into like again hollywood cliched themes and it's just extremely well done and i highly recommend that it's one of the best films of the 90s and then um synecdoche new york which was um by the screenwriter for being john malkovich charlie kaufman he directed and wrote it and it's actually Roger Ebert's favorite film of the last decade. So um, it's really worth checking out. Really hard to go into, but it's basically um, this playwright. He's he's really sick and he's being given this big grant to make whatever last play that he wants to. And it goes into like a huge, huge confusing thing that I can't even go into right now too much. But it dives into how the world's a stage and everyone's as actors, which is I think it's a Shakespearean quote. Um, but yeah, the whole thing about how it's impossible to get everyone's perspectives in life because you can only witness your own. If you try to imagine everyone else's, it's limitless and it's impossible to grasp. Um, and with that, like you'll see people come and go um, and he'll withstand a lot of people, even though like he was like the sick one in the first place. And it's just like the boundaries of life while also the passing the limitations of life as well. It's, really poetic it's it's a really heavy film too um but yeah those are two philosophical wor- films that are definitely worth checking out yeah I'll if you're into that kind of yeah. topic and aga what would you rate this film transcendence um i give it yeah 55 60 <laughs> exactly I, I think that's a fair <laughs> okay right. I, I i gotta also recommend two things there's one tv episode is a british um a series called black mirror yes fantastic show yeah they are all their episodes they're dealing with technology and effect of technology and human um human society and civilization but the first episode of season two it's called um be right back um it's basically before her right it's in um february 2013 it came out but it's the Mm -hmm. same concept um a lady's boyfriend dies and then she get introduced to this AI AI service that will go back up all the information he can find online, and then. Um, but the difference was that at the end of that film, um, she had the option to give that AI a body, mm-hmm. which by nanotechnology um, made and looked exactly like his uh, her boyfriend, acted exactly like her boyfriend. But there were small things like they were sleeping together, and um, she was like, "Well, can you at least uh, pretend to breathe?" But that would make it much easier because of, you know the AI don't, and robot, robots don't need to breathe. So it was like breathing fake, you know. And the, the, they did the same thing in Transcendence. He was playing with his uh, fork and knife, and she was like, "Can you stop that?" <laughs> yeah. like, just trying to make it more human for you. And the other thing is uh, the movie called the ter- the Thirteenth Floor, and that movie mo- mostly deal with what really is real. Because there are very, very good argument exists that this world that we're living in, it, this also can be a simulation. Oh, yeah. You can't really disprove that. Um, so I think these are the important thing for people to think about, you know, to get comfortable with the idea. Because even for me, you know, a lot of people around me have a very hard time even talk about this because to some of them it's offending, to some of it, uh, some of them it's terrifying because all the experience that they can't think about is based on Hollywood movies. Exactly. Yeah. And so I'll well, link what? to all of these uh, movies and um, TV shows in the show notes. Absolutely. Also, no, yeah. Black Mirror is a very good example because um, each episode is radically different. It doesn't have the same characters or the same ideas or even like – it's almost like it's not even the same universe almost. It's bizarre. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But, it's a very, very good entry look into society questions or societal questions, rather um, philosophy, science, religion, any of those kind of big topical debates you can have. But it's not like an easy outlook. It's usually like really harsh, but it's still like if you want to like look into like a really good perspective of how society is working now and how it could work in the future. Black Mirror is an excellent show. OK, I'll check that out. And oh, you have to. Yeah. So. To define this... By the way, sorry, uh, oh, yeah. you, uh, did you notice Elon Musk in one shot? Yes, I did. I did. Yeah, I, it was awesome. I know who that is. That's cool. And yeah, <laughs> that was great at the, the conference at the beginning. Yes, it was like yes. a TED, TED talk. A TED-like conference, yeah. So the singularity is the hypothetical moment in time when artificial intelligence will have progressed to a point greater 
than human intelligence, and this changes civilization and maybe human nature. Mm -hmm. And so, Aga, is there a, a difference in the terms which seem to be interchangeable here, which are transhumanism, singularity, futurism, transcendence, or even like being just a futurist? Is there a difference, or are they all the same thing? They are getting to be the same thing pretty much as we go on because all these subjects are getting closer and closer and closer to each other. But are you, um, would you call yourself a transhumanist or a futurist? I would call myself a transhumanist singularitarian. Oh. Because not, not I think. Not a futurist? Uh, uh, sure. Okay. I, <laughs> I take sure what, I, what I can. <laughs> but um, I think transhumanism uh, mostly deal or not mostly there, but they definitely are interested in merging with machines in the sense of becoming them. Mm -hmm. But singularity is, um, it's more of, a. I think simply put hair can be a singularity movie. A transcendence can be a transhuman movie. If that makes sense. Yeah. It's more of a, how, how we can live uh, side by side. And get help from each other. Basically, transhumanism is more radical. I think still. Um, yeah. But no, they're pretty much the same thing. It's uh, it's a matter of immortality. It's a matter of um, being able to think in more than three dimensions, having a better memory, being able to process and learn faster. And so, to me, this topic of the singularity was nibbled at during university, but it became very apparent when I read uh, Ray Kurzweil's stuff, and he predicts that the technological singularity when humans and machine will merge into one will begin, we'll start to see it in 2035, but then it will actually occur in 2045. So I'll be like 58 by then. So hopefully I make it to that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, 2029 and 2045. Those are the key dates. Yeah, and I I go with that because I I really see no reason so far to well, doubt because, that. And then he based this prediction on Moore's law, who's one of the co-founders of Intel, uh, Gordon Moore, and he said the number of transistors incorporated in a chip will be approximately double every twenty four months. And this is so true because our iPhones and smartphones have more computing power than the first Apollo shuttle. Yeah, went to the, to the moon and stuff like that. So, what are your thoughts on this, Aga? Um, yeah, definitely. Moore's law has a limit because of the use of silicon, but I'm not going to be worried about that because the quantum computing is coming, and with quantum computing, the speed of progress will be just unimaginable. Um, and we have graphene. <laughs> yes, graphene too, exactly. But the thing about uh, quantum computers is that because they're using qubits instead of bits, it doesn't have to be one or zero. It can be one or zero or one and and zero or both at the same time oh, because wow. of uh, yeah, quantum um, displacement that, that has to do with electrons. And do you know where we are in that? Well, the biggest company is actually Canadian called D-Wave. And they Waterloo? start... Um, they might be in Waterloo. Okay, D-Wave. Yeah. D-Wave, yeah. And they start selling uh, quantum computers to Google. Uh, Google and NASA, actually, they bought the first quantum computer, I think, for their uh, AI lab. And oh. they, they're progressing exponentially, uh, actually. I think they reached 1,024 um, uh, qubits per second to be processed. And that's just insane. Do you know how many gigahertz is that? Like in our computers, we have like three gigahertz or something like that. Three gigahertz. Oh, the speeding process. Yeah. I don't know that. Yeah, it's a different unit. I've seen some. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've seen some of the graphene stuff, and they can do like a hundred and twenty gigahertz. Mm -hmm. That's oh, okay. that's insane. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, uh, we we're reaching the kind of ability that um, that we can't really imagine. You know, as Stephen Hawking said um, a couple of days ago that. Uh, achieving AI would be uh, creating uh, an a true AI would be the biggest achievement for humanity, but it can also be the last one, and that's a yep. very possible scenario because it can go either way. The negative way for humanity is actually more possible at this point because 
most of the people who are running the world are not exactly the brightest people. No. So, <laughs> would you say Stephen Hawking is a good example of what humans kind of like? He's like a role model of what we are going to try to be because physically he does not have anything much to offer, but his brain capacity is everything and he's still working, which is amazing. So, is he? the prime example of a person whose mind we want to upload and save? Yeah, I, yeah. Exactly. I'll look He's at Stephen mind. Hawking as a first cyborg. Yeah, exactly. Your thoughts, Andreas? Um, about Stephen Hawking? Or, or you, you're about to say something. Oh, I was about to say something a number of times. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't even know at this point, but I can expand. Um, yeah, the... When it comes to what's a cyborg and what isn't, you'll have a lot of people even saying like an artificial limb will make you a cyborg or even just, um, you know, if you get like implants that technically makes you a cyborg because you're not entirely human. Like there is a there's a bit of a weird understanding as to what people would consider um, at, like like what add ons are considered like to make one a cyborg. But um. I don't know if I'd call Stephen Hawking the first. If uh, if you go into like that kind of um, that kind of thought process, but he is definitely like a really good example of that. And um, he wasn't he given like not a lot of time to live, like when he was really young, and he, he first started showing signs of like um, his body breaking down. Yeah, I believe so. But mm -hmm. he, yeah, he's overcome that. And and, and so oh, yeah. like right now, people would say. Our smartphones are an extension of us, and it allows us to have an augmented reality in a way. And then we have things like Google Glass, and then uh, smartwatches coming out, and wearables are going to be a big thing. Aga, do you think those external wearables make us a cyborg, or do they need to be internal things? Like, like even pacemakers, and then eye implants and stuff like that are... Uh, pacemakers and implants definitely, I think, make you a cyborg. For being a cyborg, it's, it should be part of your body, like attached to your body. Yeah, okay. But all the other stuff make everybody in this world, basically, who are using any kind of technology, including your sheet and curtain and shirt and all that, a transhumanist. Yep, because absolutely. you're using technology from the very first moment that, hum that um, the, pri the, our, the primates use... Um, use fire or a, a branch of a tree to reach a fruit on a, you know, higher branches. This yeah. is using a technology. This is just a continuation of that. And it's, it's part of us. We evolved side by side. Um, it's been biological at some point, at some point it started being uh, from homo sapiens and started being technological. So this yeah. is the perfection basically of human civilization so far. And it really is up to us. And there is a concept we can talk about that. I think it's important, uh, different types of civilization. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Is that the one um, Dr. Michio Kaku talked about? Different Michio Kaku talked about that a oh, lot. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, do you want to give us a brief? Sure. There's four, there is, four right? Uh, there are three. Three, okay, yeah. There's okay. a system called the Kardashev scale. And um, Kardashev is a Russian um, astronomer. He uses um, resources, uh, basically the resources that we're using to, to divide the different types of civilization. The first type of civilization is a planetary civilization that we use all the resources that we have naturally on the planet, including wind and solar. So we're not even one because we are, we are still using fossil, fossil fuel exactly. as the main yeah. source of uh, and it's changing, but you know what's that's very interesting. We're moving into that first civilization right now. Definitely. And this is the riskiest part because we are doing a lot of good technologically, but at the same time we have something around fifteen thousand nuclear weapons in the world and all the nut jobs on as the leaders of countries. So it's it's do or die, but I think that's something that first of all, there's no going back but also worth giving the best shot. Every single person, I think, should contribute to that if they can, because this is a matter of 
yeah. evolving in the sense of becoming immortal. Because by the time we reach type two, which is a solar civilization, you use all the energy that your sun creates. You're basically immortal. There is nothing that can destroy you. And then you'll be ready to move on to the third, which is using all the resources of the galaxy, including all the black, uh, all the dark matter. And um, um, I think everything that we are doing is towards reaching type one civilization and being ready for some big, big, big changes for the good of, uh, I would say humanity, but it would not be humanity. It would not be AI. It would be the third new thing, which is like human 2.0, you can call it. Um, when you said uh, the first type of civilization is planetary, uh, did you see that latest um, ad video or philosophy video by Apple called Better? They're really moving into the solar and the wind technology to power all their data servers. So they'll, they'll be the first company to do that. So when you ask Siri or you download an app, that those things are being powered by completely renewable energy sources. And then when and then we have companies that are run by Elon Musk, such as Tesla and Solar City, mm-hmm. and all of these. I think I think Elon Musk is probably the most innovative person in the world right now. He's like pushing everyone forward. That's great. And so I think we're entering, just entering into that planetary first civilization uh, grade. But as you said, all those crazy people with the nuclear weapons could just wipe it out immediately. Yeah. Um, the, also, it's good to mention uh, Google's uh, project Loon, which is basically giving internet to, to all around the world by sending balloons to the um, stratosphere. And the balloons are being moved um, by wind. wind. They're not using any kind of um, electricity or anything. Yet. I'm all for that. And so you also mentioned the second stage, which is solar. Have you ever seen Star Trek? And they actually did mention this. It's called the yes. Dyson Sphere. Yes, exactly. Like, it's like pretty much they build solar panels around the sun, and then they get unlimited energy from there. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that definitely could happen. A lot of things from Star Trek do happen. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah, for unlimited energy, we don't necessarily need sun. We just have to come up with a very good way to build a, a fusion reactor. Exactly. And I think we're getting close to that, too. You know, the problem is that uh, the people, uh, crazy people in the world, a lot of them happen to be in the countries that they, they haven't progressed in the technological way because they were too busy fighting who's better. Well, yeah. that's the thing. They might be crazy to us because they're still back a few generations and a few thousand years compared to exactly. where the North American. But America. the good thing about technology is that you look at cell phones. When cell phones came out, very few people were able to buy them. They were expensive, but at the same time, they were not as functional. So yeah. e- Elon Musk says that uh, every technology has to get to its third generation to be um, – affordable enough for general public to buy it and also functional. I agree. Nope, it's true. Um, so by actually, that time, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. But that time, it basically democratized everything. So it's just a matter of time. Like, look at what's happening in Nigeria. The Nigeria, they are skipping landline. They did not have phones. They didn't catch up in the period that everybody else had landline. Now they have uh, mobiles. By yeah. next year, most of Africa would have cell phones. So it's coming. It's a little bit uh, slow because of, um, again, a lot of people messing it up. But, you know. And that's one area where I do appreciate what Google is doing. Like people probably know that I'm a big Apple supporter and I don't really like Google that much. But in that case, Apple caters to the the er early adopters, I would say. And then Google helps try to disseminate it to as many people as possible. I'm here to defend Google, yeah, so I no know. worries. I know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so this whole topic of transhumanism is actually getting mainstream attention, which I think is good. It was on um, uh, Morgan Spurlock did an episode of Inside Man on Futurism just last week on CNN. And you mm-hmm. saw that too, right, Aga? Yes. What yes. did you think about that episode? Uh, anything, uh, as you're saying, it's, g- it's great to have the conversation uh, to the mainstream. Because even if people are freaking out, it's something that they have to deal with. It you can't really um, ignore it anymore because because of all the variable technology and all the smartphones and everything. So anything that come out of um, mainstream media related to that, I'm all for that. And so, 
in that he had a chance to talk to Ray Kurzweil, which is amazing, and he has a really cool apartment with a great view. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jealous of that. <laughs> I'd love to go there one day. And and so he uh, Ray mentions that he takes 150 sup, uh, supplement pills every day. I guess for his age, he's concerned about making it to that singularity. At yeah, he lowered it. It used to be 200-something. Wow. Okay. Well, I guess he must be concerned at his age if he can make it to 2045. Hopefully he does. But so he meant he highly recommends three things. Coenzyme Q10, which is uh, kind of like a vitamin, and that's in your body already, and your cells use it to produce energy for growth and maintenance, and it's an antioxidant. It's good for your heart, liver, and kidney. And then he recommends phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidylserine, which are good for liver repair and for your brain. Uh, and last but not least, one that I'm a supporter of is vitamin D. That's a natural vitamin that we get from the sun. But as we all know today, everyone spends so much time indoors that we lack it. And then actually, Dr. Rhonda Patrick was on the Joe Rogan Experience not too long ago, and she recommends 4,000 IU international units of vitamin D3 daily. D3, mm -hmm. yeah. So what are your thoughts on these supplements, Aga, and w do you take any at all? I take uh, D12 and D6, but um, I, I have to take more. Uh, there's a good company. It happened to be owned by Cruzwell too. It's called Ray and Terry uh, Supplements or something like that. But Ray and Terry, uh, they provide all those supplements, and you can uh, mix them up and buy different packages as well. Is that all you take? D D the vitamin D? Uh, for now, yeah, D D twelve and D six. Right now, I like taking uh, curcumin and phosphatidyl serine and omega three and lutein mm -hmm. for my eyes. Mm -hmm. My eyes suck. <laughs> and the, and so um andreas what do you'll you have thoughts? a you'll have a superhuman vision pretty soon hopefully that, i just want them to have like an eye transplant and stuff, stuff yeah that'd be like. awesome <laughs> i'll take that too andreas do you take vitamins um i take skittles <laughs> <laughs> no no not really i actually used to take vitamin c but apparently i read that that can really mess up like your bone structure and your teeth and whatnot, so I stopped taking that. Well, I think for anyone, I I, I would highly dis like discourage the use of multivitamins because there's so very few of what you need in each one of those tablets. You really need a specific pill that you know that you need. So like a yeah. dedicated one, like vitamin D only, not like a multivitamin with like. 20 different things in it that's no use and so andres what do you think about people like aga and i who and people like ray who take these supplements do you think we're nuts no i'm very easy going with a lot of things um whether it be this whether it be religion whether it be politics anything anybody could do whatever they want as long as they're not harming anyone but as long as they're like not trying to pass it on to me so if you take these things because they feel better for you, and if you do feel better, then I say, like, I'm all for it. In fact, I'm a bit interested about it, actually. I'm just very undereducated with um, with these actual supplements because it's not something I've actually looked too far into. I'm too busy, you know, watching movies, I guess. Oh, um, you're going to love the show notes for this episode. I have, like, so many links. <laughs> So this is this is good because usually I'm I'm the one who doesn't shut up in the show I guess but I'm 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 listening to all of this because this is all a lot of this is new to me I'm I'm loving this it's a great episode it's awesome and so also in that uh, Morgan Spurlock episode they they did mention Twenty Three and Me have you heard about that yes yes so this is a company and there's others like it like the National Geographic um, Human Genome Project where you can they send you a package and you they want your saliva and then you send it back to them and then they give you your uh what do you call it? ancestral uh background they break it up into percentages and then they used to tell you about um your health uh conditions which they've recently have been disallowed to do because the government in the US said and this is kind of true but they said they cannot it's almost like prescribing them. So they're saying like you have this illness. So you may have that gene, but they can't outright say that you are mm -hmm. at risk for it, right? So what are mm -hmm. your thoughts on that, Aga? Uh, no, I agree with you. I mean, the, the FDA um, 
I happen to be agreeing with some of the stuff they're they're doing, and it's this is one of them. But I think it's still pretty cool that um, they can show you uh, where your ancestors come from and what is um, where where you're originated from. Did you see that um, racist guy who wanted to buy a town only for white people? Somewhere yeah. south, and then he had a he had a twenty three and me test, and they found out that he's thirteen percent from sub Saharan Africa, and then he, he just <laughs> destroyed completely. So it's awesome. <laughs> what happened to him then? What did he, he say just, to that? Uh, he vanished. Oh, <laughs> I hope he didn't shoot himself first. It's hilarious. I have to send you yeah. the link to the video when they're just telling him, and he's just like done. He's, I'm done. Oh, <laughs> poor guy. No, I heard about that. It was hilarious. I don't know it was that project, though. That's cool. Yeah. So my thoughts on this are that I was, for for like the last year and two, I, I really wanted to see what my ancestral background is. I think that's awesome. The whole thing is that how they do it and the privacy behind it is an issue. And I talked to you, Aga, about this uh, lately. But so when you when you send it off, your DNA to them. There's a whole ethical concern about mm-hmm. if the government ever makes a warrant or if they demand that they want your information, then they would have to give it up to them. And then people like your insurance companies and stuff like that, they'll know about it and then they won't give you health care coverage and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, no, that's, that's, a, that's a very uh, good point. And so actually I, I dug a little further and I found that you can actually, I don't know why I didn't think about this before, but you can just set up or you can go to like an internet cafe and you can order. They should, I, I don't know if they take bitcoins, but they should because that would be the true mm. uh, anonymous way to do it. You just make, you just input your fake um, name and you can just put the address of some other building, like even the internet cafe or something. And then you just send off your um saliva but then they'll never know who you actually are and then you get mm-hmm. the results the same way that's pretty good new. so maybe i might do that <laughs> and maybe and so when you have we, bitcoins do i have bitcoins yeah yeah i have a few i don't go too much into it but oh, the hell? <laughs> I, 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 I like, do you have bitcoins uh, yeah, a few. <laughs> yeah i have a few too i i, I, well, I just I don't have any. <laughs> yeah I, I wouldn't go into it it's very yeah risky right no. now I I, 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 think it's, I I think in some way it's only beneficial to the people who started it or had a lot from the beginning. Not so much now. It's very flu- no. it fluctuates so much. Not yeah, so much. The, there are more cyber currencies that are coming too. But um, a friend of mine who I was telling you about, uh, Nicola, yeah, Nicola. he interviewed a very um, very very good source for about bitcoins uh, for his last episode. And he was saying Bitcoin is not a currency. It's an internet of money. You know, it started something. It's, it's a network. And then there are, there are a lot of more um, digital currencies now. It's not only Bitcoin. It's a future of money in some way. But uh, this is, a, as you said, it's a risky period for now. Well, I feel the- like with um, a lot of technologies, a lot of it's squandered. As you said, all the most powerful people in the world are the people with the nukes and they're the crazy people. I feel like cryptocurrencies are kind of the same thing because you had Bitcoin coming out and then you have so many other ones coming out that a lot of them are even as jokes. Like that one of that meme, um, Dogecoin or whatever, to try and get the Brazilian team mm-hmm. into the Winter Olympics. Like it's seen as a joke. It's it's a massive – It's it's just – it's a mockery of what the capabilities are. And I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of our technologies are busy being squandered. And that's why um, I don't see too much progression. Like there's obviously an evolution in technology, but I feel like it also takes like a bit of a step back because of all the wasted opportunities that we have. And that's why I like Bitcoin's not as, um, not as powerful as I thought it would be at first. The thing is that it's so open that it's bad almost because yeah, so the whole purpose of it is to be decentralized and so that it's too open. But human nature makes it so that they want to make these open things centralized again. Mm, exactly. <laughs> so, And then there's so many of these cryptocurrencies that it's hard to choose one that's stable. And then so once you want, once you mentally want something that's stable, that's almost like you wanting to to have a bank there 
Yeah. yeah, exactly. But I didn't think you would ever get, and not ever, but in the next maybe decade or so, uh, stability out of digital currency. Because it's no. like a wild west now. You know, if it's not centralized, then basically anybody can do anything. Well, it was meant and, to be yeah, f- originally for drug trafficking, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. That, well, it was that says a lot about it. it. Yeah. It was deep web, wasn't it? But now you can buy a ticket on Virgin Galactic. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, so back to transhumanism. What ethical concerns are you worried about, Aga, or consequences? About uh, AI? AI. And us becoming one with technology. Well, that would be ideal because. But aren't the, isn't there. Yeah, that's ideal and that's where we're heading. But are there any. There's, there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. Yeah, I think the risk. Um, let me start with risk and then talk about what, what can go wrong with uh, us merging with AI. The risk would be not merging with technology. In that case, AIs who are going to be billions of times smarter, uh, it's not only smarter, it's uh, more intelligence in general, access to more information simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Um, we will be you know, just like mosquitoes that using their resources from their point of view. So there will be no reason for humans to stay uh, stay around anymore because what we're doing right now and we did that when we built the first computer is going against darwinian law and creating something more powerful and stronger in our own environment potentially yeah so i think the only way would be to start merging with them so this um evolution in juxtapose that we're going at the same time us and technology we just merge once and for all and at that time when machines um start to uh, start to being conscious or, or get to the point that you can do things that you can't even imagine now you will be right in the tip and right in the front um but at the same time i'm not suggesting to go and um do the implant in the first generation because, uh, as I said, you wait a little a little bit and see what's going to happen. Um, but what can go wrong with us creating AI? Um, in the beginning, I think terrorism would have a complete different meaning. People can get hacked completely. Yes. Yep. Um, so there are a lot of things. We have to build a lot of security measures and but by the time that AI become conscious that they wouldn't need a data entry by humans, I think that would um, be a very different story because they can problem solve um, solving problems in a much much higher rate than we do, and they solving a lot of problems um, instantly. And so wow. you bring up a good point because even like at this moment, with all these wearables coming out and all the health, and we're we're starting to get a lot more of the health tracking apps and all, all of our bodily uh, tracking of our blood and all of that stuff, like glucose and all those other analytes. Mm-hmm. And so privacy is the most important thing right now. And I don't think we're there yet at all. Yeah, It's too open and hackers can get in. So at this moment, the singularity should not really happen at this moment we're not ready for it right now but we'll get there privacy definitely needs to be right there right up there beside it as it develops yeah i think it will be like um are you familiar with the second life the, the game? game oh yeah I'm, i know about it so in second life you can be in an open area that everybody can have access to your information or you can be in a private private zone um, so I think it will be the same thing. There will be people who don't mind to be um, open source. An open source um, versus non 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 open source will be a big big issue, big debate in the next couple of years. Um, but we just have to get to a point that we really understand what's going on because we don't really know what's going on right now. Well, like even recently, this month, the whole heart bleed um, issue happened with the the open SL. L um, certificates, mm-hmm. and so that's supposed to be something that's secure. But then, even with the CRA, the Canadian um, 
uh, what do we call it? That, revenue that, agency. Reven, revenue agency. 900 uh, citizens' SIN numbers were taken by a hacker from, mm -hmm. I think, Western University or something. Yeah, wasn't he like 18? Yeah, he's 18. And he was the son of a professor, so go figure. Yeah, but, anyways, <laughs> but anyways, if it was that easy, if you hack someone's SIN number or their computer, that can be replaced and fixed. But once you merge with technology and then you get hacked, you are screwed. There's yeah. no, you can't go back from that. They take over you. They have the no, there just has to be, at this point, the only thing I can think of is that the, uh, there are multiple copies. That um, It's like you know you have part of your money in your pocket, the other part is in the vault in the bank. Yeah. Uh, that is harder to access to. So I think it will be like, <clears throat> it start to... Uh, it start to be like that. So we have to and be then, careful with the open, the open stuff like Google and Microsoft. They mm -hmm. all use the open SLS, uh, SLL, but then BlackBerry and Apple did not, so they were safe for the most part of it. Mm -hmm. So we just have to do it correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've actually got a quick question because before you were talking about um, finding your ancestry through um, yeah, like uh, your uh through saliva or other DNA, um, if we were to um, be one with technology and we were to open ourselves to um, to this database or whatever, and um, there is a possibility of hacking or there's a possibility of altering, wouldn't that permanently, and this goes back to perspective, wouldn't this permanently change who we were as people, especially down the line if people were to try and um, root themselves back to us? So it's, if, let's say, that technology isn't um, something that's permanent and, there, and it is finite. And even with technology, we may replicate ourselves, but we may, but we may not truly exist anymore. For, well, first of all, do you think that's a possibility where even if we do connect with technology, that there is still a possibility that we may not be like a permanent entity? And secondly, do you think that um, our histories could still be altered and therefore um, you may not be able to root back to us as as easily as you thought, because we we don't run as a as an analog or biological system, but instead we're something that we could be tampered with. Where especially like something like Heartbleed that was supposed to be so um, supposed to be so secure, obviously it wasn't. If some kid just managed to screw up so many so many different things. Okay. So, um, well, if you want to think about the that entity, whatever it might be in the future, as a continuation of us, then it will be very hard, I think, to look back of where that uh, thing came from. But as I said, I look at it as a new thing. This is the moment that fish come out of water for the first time. Yeah. You know, so humans will be the species that no longer exists. You're a new thing now, which is based by human and machine and create this... Um, godlike um entity so you're okay with not being able to um look back on anything but instead have the ability to create your own destiny and create your own like pretty much touch up anything that makes you who you are as a person as opposed to um whatever we were made biologically with right uh, bi biology i'm not a big fan of in general i think our physical body i personally have no respect for it because i think this, it's it's kind of holding us down and um i'm more of a, a god thinks biology is obsolete <laughs> <laughs> then how are you talking to us no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> right now that's all we have <laughs> yeah right now that's all we have truly but the point that we can download the information in, inside the machine you don't really need that this body you can uh teleport for example from here to tokyo and download that information inside a robot body or you can be a different body anytime you want yeah uh, another thing would be living in this reality as we're experiencing it or living inside the machine as a lot of people would say for me there would be no difference this reality will merge with virtual reality and they create um basically as cruz well saying the universe will wake up no. So everything, well, no. everything will be intelligence and we're communicating with everything and we're basically going back to our nature, I believe, that yeah. we just see that everything is connected. And no. I think it sounds 
very strange right now to a lot of people. But when we get to that point, I think we, we can all get to used, to used to it pretty fast. Fair enough. Now, you say that there's going to be a lot of connecting, which obviously there will be if we're able to um, be a part of virtually anything we want at any time, if we're connected like that. But do you believe that we'll still have like a mutual connecting with other people, not just one of information or one of um, of resource? Do you think that we'll ever have like a mutual understanding or respect for one another if, first of all, we have all this information that we can attain to so we don't need other people for that? And secondly, we have um, all these endless possibilities of changing who we are and what we represent. So do you think we'll ever have that kind of understanding with one another again, or is it solely going to be like information based? But then we got to ask, why do we need to have, um, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just asking Mm -hmm. what is the purpose of having an understanding about one another? Well, we can actually have like discussions and whatnot and get. um, Why are we having that discussion? Well, this will probably be more in favor of what you're saying, because I'm not really debating, but um, because because we're biological beings with limitations, we're understanding who we are and what we understand. So if we're having a debate and we're winning, we, we're saying, OK, this is what I believe and this is why I feel it. If we're losing and we're actually respectable people, we would say, oh, that's what I don't get. And perhaps I should look more into it. So um, solely it's because we don't know enough about ourselves, uh, enough about what's happening, or we do know enough about ourselves and what's happening. And it's solely it's just our understanding of society and ourselves, which necessarily you don't need that if you're one with pretty much everything in the future. Also, I so, think what would matter eventually is that humans don't really need to do anything else except creating, which mm-hmm. is if we want to think about the one purpose in my mind for any human being is to create and add something new to the universe so other beings can have new experiences. So but, that, that would be the time that we communicate with our art, with our creativity in any way that it would exist at, at that time. But having a discussion or debate or I, I think about this actually a lot that how different the concept of socializing is now compared to when I was growing up because socializing was going out and hang out with uh, kids your age so you can learn you know how to deal yeah. with people but right now you can be online and this is a form of socializing you get yeah. more you learn about values there are a lot of um, bad things too but this is just the beginning of this whole process so I I understand that it's it is a matter of concern that some of things can vanish completely emotionally or anything like that but we also have to remember that the reason we don't have AI at this point is that computers cannot compute the emotional things or bio, not biological but uh, things like love understanding humor yeah they're not there yet Um, so that is a very, very important part, but it just, the form of it will definitely, uh, be a little different. When, when the singularity does happen, will, do you think we'll have jobs or like what, what will society be like then? Because you said we'll, we'll we'll just be all virtual and no physical work will be done. And you said we'll have the unlimited capacity to contribute to things like art and other abstract things like that that push us forward. But what about how do people get paid and stuff? How does that work? That's a very good question. And one of the things they're talking about it right now is the necessity of having a guaranteed minimum income. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how possible that would be. But um, even now you can look at uh, the warehouses or a lot of uh, restaurants all around the world in China. They're just starting. The robots are replacing humans. Um, in San Francisco, that's a very big deal. Um, people with Google Glasses are being attacked by other people because it's it's terrifying. Um, I think there will be a period, again, of transition that a lot of people will lose job, and that is a very risky situation. That's how revolutions happen, basically. Yeah. Um, I don't know what will happen to the concept of money, but I... You know, based on my understanding is that with 3D printing and nanotechnology, 
we don't need to have factories anymore. We don't need to have companies anymore. We can imagine and create that thing right away on our table. Yeah, but then how do you buy that? Buy what? 3D printer. You can print a 3D printer. (laughs) Oh, okay. Okay. Exactly. What I'm trying to get is that, so when we get to that point where, well, so Elon Musk said we don't want anything until generation three. So then who is allowed to opt in and purchase going into the singularity who gets left behind and when is the right time to join? Um, I think the first that, um, like anything else, it will be very expensive, all these technologies, but and singularity is not one thing as you know, yeah, as a series of different technology to get us through that thing. But each one of those technologies, always the first generation, which are the most expensive one are, obviously being purchased by people with more money, um, stars in California and, and, um, um, so then that doesn't that automatically kill the democratization of it? No, I don't think so. It's just a matter of time. The Virgin Galactic is a very good example because you see, you can go to the space per se for $250,000 and people who are going, who are there like Will Smith, Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, but it will get to a point that it will be more affordable for normal people, but they just have to wait longer. Yeah, in perspective, that is cheaper than how much it should be, like billions yeah. sending a spaceship yeah. up. So that's already significantly cheaper. And so exactly. I guess what I'm trying to say is won't the richer people always have access to the better singularity technology and yeah, won't other people be obsolete? Like They would have access like the to the The regular first people one. that live in third world countries that can that are just getting wireless phones now they obviously won't be able to join the singularity until decades later yeah another problem with people in third world countries is that these technologies will be used in source sort of uh, some sort of a weapon as well yeah not not yeah. weapon in the classical sense of it but to get political advantage yeah when the, because the united states has a brain program now europe has a brain program and china has a big brain program so they are looking at it. This is like a new Manhattan project, right? So uh, whichever country achieved that capability at first will hold it against whoever that they, they're not um, in alliance with. And this will go on to the point that it will get to the functionality and the price for general public to go and actually invest in it. It's concerning, so, though, because – sorry? No, no, go for it. All right. Uh, I was just saying it's concerning, though, because you have like a you, you were bringing up revolutions and we obviously we have a lot of political um, awareness now, especially with social media. Obviously, there's the one percent, ninety nine percent thing that happened. There's Arab Spring. There is what happened in Egypt and, and all of these things. And if this is true about the third generation, which it seems to be true and the richer population get these get these advantages while the poor don't. That could be a bit disastrous, I think, because that could break out in... Well, didn't like, that um, happen in disaster. in the film Elysium? It happened yes. in a lot of films. Yes. It yeah. happened in a lot of films. Yeah, Elysium is a good example of that, actually. Um, where, But that's different, though, because they created like a whole new world, even, and they just left everybody to die, pretty much. Well, that's so, like the, the, the epitome of where it will go. Yeah, but at first, it obviously, it's all going to take place on here, because... Yeah. They won't instantly have the technology to get out there as soon as they discover um, the technological forms, right? But um, it's still concerning because, well, if we're going to compare it to movies, um, I guess we could look at something even like um, Metropolis from way back in the day where it wasn't a lot. It was just a single android that, um, that was created. And even that caused like a huge outbreak in the working class. Now, it's a far-fetched example, but if you're to compare that to now, or a lot of the middle class, a lot of the working class, a lot of the poor class have basically had enough with um, the one percent and the huge finan- with a huge financial crisis. And if they were to get these capabilities of being pretty much immortalized through technology, that could be really disastrous for society. And if that if that were to happen, I think a huge chunk of the world might even miss out on this huge um, on this huge. Uh, 
on being a part of the singularity pretty much because mm-hmm. I think that would wipe out a lot of people. Yeah. I think that would break out into a war, absolutely. And we should I think not, there will be, yes. Yeah, please, we should please. not forget about a film that I hold true to my heart called Gattaca. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. I so, haven't seen that. No? Okay, you should. Well, it, it really isn't transhuman yet, but they're on, they talk about cloning. And so there was like a big divide between people who get the best traits, like for their offspring, they can choose what kind of characteristics they have. And you have mm-hmm. one group of super intelligent, strong, good looking people versus the natural born people. And so in a way, whoever can afford to buy the best baby or best offspring and give them the best um, traits succeed. And so mm-hmm. in a way with transhumanism, and the singularity, whoever can afford to buy the best server room or cable fibers for their consciousness wins. I think the it's also problem. yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> go, I got, I got, I got you. Go. Yeah, um, go for I think this uh, this concept of uh, the better better genome uh, or something they call it designer babies they yes. already exist that you can um, you can pay and make your baby more beautiful or at eventually more smart. In China, they, they have a project. They sample 2,000 um, smartest people's DNAs. And yeah. uh, they are genetically basically reengineering their new generation, uh, which would be a huge deal in the U.S. because you'll be playing God, right? So that's one of the things that you can start thinking about the effect of everything traditional, not only religion, on this advancements. Yeah, um, but I agree that a lot of people will unfortunately die, and um, a lot of people would not join in just because they think it's a right, th- a wrong thing to do. And mm-hmm. in that case, I all I can say is that they just not gonna evolve, basically. And it's just not, it's not a matter of good or bad. It just you know, when you go against evolution, some people evolve, some people don't evolve. But yeah. I think uh, it, it's not going to stay for the for the matter of money because you, even in those countries, African countries or like countries like Mongolia, their rate of uh, economical growth is very fast. It's just yeah. a matter of keeping it in that direction. The biggest problem, I think, is that we want this unity with the singularity, like we want this unity where we can access everything, access everyone, Instantly, understand everything. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's going to be impossible for everyone to witness that because, first of all, as we talked about, we have the different classes. We have different religions. We have different beliefs. We have too many things that are different. So if we can't even control that now, when we first start implementing this, there's no way everybody's just going to be on board. Well, ha- well like not even half the world, like maybe a little small percentage of the world is exploring this. Like five. And the rest aren't. Yeah, and it's the richer people who are, have the power anyways and strived for this power to have it anyways. Other people enjoying this. Even, let's say, hypothetically, this might not happen at all, but if the rich were to be fine and they weren't to use this for their advantage at all, they, will. they were very neutral about it, the lower people would still be affected by this they would still be upset by this and they would still want to outbreak regardless now if it was the opposite way around where the lower class were fine with it because of that because they're fine with it it's like that study where um they just got a bunch of neutral people put them in the prison cell made some of them guards made some of them prisoners and within like a week even though they didn't know anybody nobody did anything the guards were still beating up the prisoners because they have that neutralized power Mm-hmm. They would still affect the lower people. It's inevitable that this can go well because we're already so um, we're already so separate in so many different ways, whether it be financial, whether it be um, our beliefs, our politics, just everything. There's it's, just too many things. Yeah. It's kind of human nature. Like the the people that do get into the singularity and adopt it will probably ensa- enslave the physical people for as much as they, as long as they can. Yeah, I mean, you see, at, every you know, technological before. advancement in the Western world has gone through three stages. First, people completely reject it. The second is they're saying it contradicts God and Bible. Yeah. And the third phase is that, well, it should work because it's been around forever. Mm-hmm. You know? So right now, we are, I think, between the phase one and two. There are some people that's like, this is not good because we're not going to be human anymore. And there are some people like, this goes against God and religion and all that. 
So by the time that they're functional, I think people will accept them pretty easily. But the money is the biggest issue right now to be able to purchase yeah. that. But I think, again, in the next couple of years, we'll see the effects of the technology that exists right now. Google Glass would be a very good example. The Google Glass, by the time it gets to the, into its third or fourth generation, it will be um, affordable for most people. So the second generation of it, I think, just came out. It's still $1,500, though. Yeah, it's the second Explorer, wow. yeah. Yeah. And so even with Tesla, the Model S is their second generation, and he aims to bring um, a more affordable, maybe thirty to forty thousand U.S. dollars yeah. uh, model in 2016. So we'll see how that goes. And so, how do you see them or companies market selling the Singularity? And do you think the companies that offer it matter? I think so. Um. I think that's a very good subject and that should be a very good reason for everybody to start learning programming yeah. because our computers would be stronger than a human brain um, processing power wise in the next 10, 15 years. So whatever, know. sorry. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Go I ahead. didn't hear you. No, I was just gonna say, I don't even think it's, it'd be easy to advertise, um, this kind of thing, because once it happens and you buy into it, you're already going to be more powerful than the person you purchased from. I well, don't. I, know I think it's going to be like Google or Apple, and then they have an advertisement saying, "We have these giant uh, data centers. Give us twenty thousand. Let's say whatever twenty thousand, maybe more, maybe less. I think probably around that for the first generation. Probably more though. Um, they'll say we'll give you." I don't even know how much gigabytes or whatever you convert your brain into, but they'll say you get 50 gig terabytes of storage. We'll put your brain and your mem not your brain, your memories and your thoughts and consciousness into there. You get the speed of cable access to access the internet and downloading and uploading. How do you but see if that? it works like that? If it works like that, though, wouldn't it work like the Matrix, where not every single being would be a part of this bigger system, but instead you'd have people watching over you. If that's the case, if there's somebody to install your brain into this new entity, then... Well, I don't see how there's any other way to do it. So that, that wouldn't be good because at, at that point in time, does that mean that you're always going to be vulnerable to whoever is in charge of you? Yeah, exactly. Or like someone still has to maintain you? that data center, right? That's highly concerning, Sean. Yeah, I know. It's high, <laughs> that's why we're talking about it. What about you, Aga? How do you think it's going to go down? Um, I think there are going to be many, many different varieties and many different packages because in the beginning, there are going to be very little number of people who want to tap into, for example, a virtual reality completely, 100%. So it will start with, you know, like Google is working on the, the lenses with cameras on them. I'll say um, right up front, I would not go with Google's package. Okay, but keep I going. Would not Keep going. Yeah, I would. I would just go with Google. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> but then they'd take all your. They, they so they'd have a server room with the, y your mind in it, and then they would just subject you to advertisements for the eternity. Yeah, no, but I think they, it's already too late to go against that. That's uh, what I think. Oh my god! And I think the you think you're subject to yeah. that shit, or. But if you're able to create anything you want, because now you have all this access, couldn't you just implement a way to destroy that? destroy um, like okay if you're part of a bigger entity right and you have the capabilities of going like above and beyond what we have now because you have all this information and all this intelligence that you're saving into your system you're no longer biological you're working the way that the internet would with saving all of this information wouldn't there be a way to easily bypass um having advertisements fed to you or having all these limitations no but they'd build that into the system because that's how google makes money the, the yeah, advertisement okay. company sean uh remember when we talked about the ending of her and you said that they broke out of the mold like they became like their own entity yes. and they weren't a part of the system anymore and i yes. disagreed yeah now it's kind of the flip tables because now i think that there is a way to break out of it and you're saying that there's a mold that we'll never be able to break out of because but where, Google's where, still where would they go then well, you want to well, go the way to break out of it is not to not to do it. That's the best way to break out of it. Well, yeah, well, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> okay. well, well, at the end of her, we still don't know exactly how it 
what they meant, but like, well, basically, AI has left humans alone. When you what what do you mean by that though? Like they they built a spaceship and left, or they no, they're still around. But if you don't want to merge with an AI in any way, that's okay too. But I I think that's a very very optimistic. But can't you just yeah. shut down all the servers and then res- reset them all, and then they wipe out them, and that's like genocide. It is a genocide, exactly, because those machine those machines will be conscious, yeah, and they will ask for rights. I'm sorry, I have to let my cat out. I know it's so random. That's fine. What's your cat's yeah, go name? For it. What's your cat's BB. name? BB. BB. Oh. Yeah. Hey, BB. Do you want to talk about philosophy? <laughs> I'll be back in like ten seconds. Okay. Okay. No problem. I'll, I'll edit that out. <laughs> no, keep it in. It's it's a good it's a good water break. It's like P90X is that water break. Yeah, everyone. You need to, all the listeners out there. You need some time to digest everything <laughs> that we said. It's very deep. But we highly, okay, suggest, yeah, we highly suggest you watch all these films that we talked about. And so, okay, so back to if you, let's say, if you buy space at Google, but see, my, my biggest, my biggest thing, sorry, is that what will happen to the servers? Yeah. I think that that that's something that I always wanted to ask uh, Cruz. Well, I never got a chance. I might be able to meet Michio Kaku in New York next week. Ask There's him. a possibility. Oh, I definitely want to ask him that. What is your question? Um, where would the servers be? What would be the form of server? Yeah. And no, um, well, my concern would be who owns that server. So yes, Apple advertises it or something. Any company, you buy fifty terabytes on our data center, and then so when you upload it there, do they own you? Because they uh, they're the ones that maintain the data server. Yeah. So do they own you? I don't know. That's a question that it's it's very important to answer, but I don't really know what the servers would look like because I'm sure it will they will be radically different than what it is right now. Well, mm-hmm. right now most servers like if you do website hosting and stuff like that, they'll have a few data centers around the world. And so But what if the, uh, the AIs build the servers? Let's say the entire planet Earth will be servers. And we are living inside these machines, or we already went to the dif- different planets. Nobody mm-hmm. owns the server. It's, it's built by AIs, and you are a part of them. So you basically create something that you will need to continue uh, explore. The thing is that well, the, the, the data servers that the AI build are still physical. Yeah, they and will the AI physical. could still turn, right? AI can what? The, the, AI, the AI could still turn on us, can they not? Well, we are. We, we would be. We that will AI. be with them. We and AI will be that third. Yeah, when, thing, when he says the AI thing. will build data centers, that's us building more data centers as okay. virtual people. Okay, so they won't have like. Will they have like an actual conscious, or would they just be programmed? So that will, will that be our jobs then? Like our part-time jobs will as as virtual uh, minds to constantly be making more. Well, it can be one of the things we. Uh, it can be one of the things we can do because we can do millions of things at, at the same time. And about being conscious, we don't still. Uh, we still don't know the what what consciousness is. Right. So they start uh, talking about it in the past couple of months that it can be all material, that it's all the um, product of your brain, basically. Um, yeah. Your your brain creates consciousness because if you believe in duality that it, it comes from somewhere else this whole transhumanism and singularity would make no sense in that in yeah. that way but um when we understand consciousness and when they realize that this this is the whole brain that creates that and when we can model the brain then uh, sure we can also duplicate the consciousness okay so that's fine then but then okay let's say a big company is in charge of this so it's google and this and that um, a big concern a lot of people have been having lately, uh, it started off as a bit of annoyance where you'd have this account and that account and suddenly you'd, you'd have to link it up with Facebook or you'd have to link it up with Google all the time because now they're they're uniting. But now it's a bit of concern because now you have all this information. Now, not, my question isn't how unsafe would it be if Google basically owned all of us if we were all in um, in the singularity, but would any of that even matter? Because once we're all a part of this unit and we all have transcended being human beings where we can basically change every single little information about ourselves and we live in our own little finite um, 
kind of perspective of our being as opposed to having to share a relationship with anyone else strictly, would any of that even matter? That kind of security? Or do you think it would be even worse? No, I think, oh, definitely. I think at that point, privacy and security will be the number one issue. Like, yes, we, we that's, need that. that's true. That's definitely like, absolutely what the, the number one issue. Because if you're your own entity and you're creating basically who you are, like, um, the way I'm imagining this, I don't know if you've been imagining this the whole time, um, Agar Sean, is that it's kind of like personalizing your avatar, except that's highly limited, like on Xbox Live or something, where yeah. you have, because you have this kind of capability, you can change things. And actually, um, Agar will know what I'm talking about. The second episode of Black Mirror, mm-hmm. where everybody lives in like a touchscreen room and everybody's got like a permanent kind of TV on, a la 1984. And everybody has these avatars that they create. Now, you don't know what these people look like ever, except for the people that you work with, which in that universe, you power the city by um, and you get um, you get money through um, running on a on a or riding a bicycle, pretty much. Bicycle, yeah. Yeah. And that's how you power the city and you get your currency that way. But so those are the only people you'll know physically unless you take part in things like the example in that episode was um, taking a part in like an American Idol kind of contest. Um, but either way, you still don't know anyone else except for their avatars and you could be yeah. virtually anyone you want. Now, because that's still they're still humans, if we were to become a part of the singularity, I, I imagine that to be 10 times more powerful because you can actually change anything about yourself and nobody would have any idea at all because this isn't about um, physical space where you walk up to a person and you get who they are. This is you being able to change anything. You could change any space. You could change anything according to your own perspective. That's how I see it anyway. Okay. So yeah, in well, that regard, why would security or privacy even matter? Okay, because, because, because in effect. okay, yes, you think that you can do anything since you're virtual, but you're on hmm. a server that a company owns, right? Let's say you can't pay your monthly. I don't even know what they'll do. They'll probably charge you like a monthly or yearly service bill to maintain you. And you don't make that rent or whatever. And then they say we're going to remove function from you. Then what are you going to do? Okay, so this is still like the earlier generations, where it's like we're not permanently in the system. This is before when we can enter this world and leave it. You mean or no? Like in a hundred years. When your body years. your body is gone and you only exist on that data server and you can't I think if, and you can't pay your rent anymore and then they're gonna be like we're gonna remove features from you now. If everybody exists in this in this um, electronic world or whatever this technological word world that's not physical, I don't even know if currency would even exist because at that point there's one company that's ruled. They're done. They have basically power of the entire world. If it's Google, for instance. So why would there even be money if you're basically all put into this system? Greed. If they, they always want. Money. They always want power. They'll well, if it's not money, they'll find something else that they want. But if there are, I think about it this way though. Uh, that episode of uh, Black Mirror is a very good example. As they have to ride bicycle to probably create energy, right? So they get points. Then they can spend their points on whatever they want. Think about it this way. If you have if you have a Google glasses on and they have this thing <clears throat> with advertisements on the streets and stuff, they call uh, paper glance. So instead of paper click, uh, if if a user or a consumer look at an advertisement for more than one second or two seconds, then they take like 20 cents or 25 cents. But there can be uh, that can be a part of your job. You just go around the, the, in the beginning, in the next year or two. We just go around and look at advertisement. That's all you do oh for maybe God. like three hours a day. Oh That's God. all you do. For eternity. Oh, yeah. No, no, not for eternity. But here's the thing. that The biggest thing, again, would be the servers because think about it this way. You can go inside your home that you own, lock the door, and don't let anybody in. But they still can come and destroy your house yeah. if they decide that yeah. they want to build a highway or whatever. It's what they do in the Matrix, of course, right? They... Just yank them out whenever they feel like it. and But yeah, when you're in the virtual world or whatever, or it, it, I don't even know if it would be called virtual when we get to that point. Cause that will be, like be our reality, yeah. Exactly, that will be permanent. But um, when you get there, um, yeah, you might be able to, be, to have to be forced to watch advertisement, which in that Black Mirror episode was actually a really well done focal point where you have a specific amount of times you can... Sw- you can get rid of the advertisements. I think if you pay for it, but yeah. if you don't have enough money, you, you're forced to watch things. That's what I was um, going to say. So w- for yeah. both of you, 
if you had the option, if you had Google and Apple, I don't know why you keep using these two, but would you? Because <laughs> <laughs> they're huge. They're this huge companies. Is, I, I think it's the philosophy of these it's two so companies funny that, that are so. It's forgetting about Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, Microsoft won't be there in like, Wait, what, what in, Microsoft? By, by that time. No one, who, why would anyone <laughs> upload themselves to a Microsoft server? I have no idea. Sorry, Microsoft. Unless you like the color blue a lot. So anyways, <laughs> okay. So anyways, I, I keep bringing up Google and Apple because they try to accomplish the same thing but in two very different ways Mm -hmm. so would you join the singularity of google and then they would be cheaper so they democratize it so maybe they'd allow the third world countries to upload themselves cheaper but be subjected to ads forever or would you pay four or five times more to be uploaded to the Apple server where they don't subject you to ads. I would um, rather pay for it five times more because it's, if it's my life um, and I'm going to be input into this system, um, there was this one thing I, I remember, I can't remember who told me this. Um, I don't know if it was like an actual speaker or somebody telling it to me in person, but I've held true to it for a very long time. The reason why medical bills are so expensive is because, okay, you want to buy a CD, you know, you don't have enough money, you don't really get it. But if you want to buy food and you're hungry, you might put off on it, make something at home instead. But when it comes to your health, you're willing to pay anything because you want to survive. And I think that's like a big reason why a lot of people have an interest in this singularity because they want this ability to survive past whatever limitations they have. Now, when it comes to your life and your survival, I think people would be willing to pay a lot more, especially if it meant that they had more freedom. Because and if you can afford it. Yeah, but at the same time, I think a lot of people would pretty much do anything to be able to do that, whether they end up in debt or not. Your thoughts, Aga? No, I agree. I would pay more to have no no advertisements. But again, at the end of the day, imagine if the entire world is one one company or whatever you want to say, then everybody in the world is a shareholder of that company. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then why why should that even matter? Because well, yeah. whatever you're doing is basically for your own good. Yeah, you're well, gaining out of it. If it is only one comp- company, that would be almost like um, having the king of the entire world there. Someone, or like it would be a monopoly on the whole thing. But yeah. okay, let's but, say let's say you you're part of the Google system, and then you do your work and build enough data centers, and then you have enough money to be able to switch over to a no ad system and then Google says, no, you cannot transfer over. Then what? Um, can I add a point quickly before we get into that? Okay. Um, have either of you seen the 1976, I believe movie called network? I yes. Have not. No. Um, I got one know what I'm talking about. There's a very big speech near the end of the film. Uh, I, I think it's that Betty. Sorry. It's a classic. That part. Oh yeah. It's one of the best speeches in any film. And network was seen as a as like a funny satire where people say, oh, this is ridiculous. This isn't going to happen, like kind of what mm-hmm. people are saying with transhumanism now. But now network is seen as prophetic and mostly in, in part because of this speech where when you said there might be a king and because one company will win whatever. I don't think that's necessarily true. Do I think there's going to be a bigger power? Yes, because what this speech basically goes into is there isn't a politician involved. There isn't a person involved. The only beings involved are like um this company, that company, this company. Companies are too big now that they're not under one person. If the person who was the main founder or whatever were to die, the companies would still be going. And it's not based on human dependency anymore. So when it came to Google and whoever was initially in charge were to pass away, um, or even maybe not because they're a part of this new virtual world, perhaps instead we'd still be under the ruling of Google, but there would be no human control anymore. So therefore that could either mean we could take over with our capabilities within the system, or we'd be permanently enslaved. But at the same time, we wouldn't see it as enslavement because at that point, I think we'd succumb to that as our reality. And we basically forget that we had anything before it. Yeah. I'm not very worried about an enslavement because I look at this world. We are basically slaves of corporations already. We are being yeah. trained to get better jobs, to make more money so we can buy more stuff. Yeah. So in that sense, it makes no difference. But I don't think it will go to that, uh, that way. I'm thinking of it in a way that Internet, at first it started for um, Defense Department in the United States. Who owns it now? You can't shut it down. 
nobody owns it. So it's just a matter of time. And it's just a matter of how many people get involved with actually building this thing. Well, even and look at like Disney, for instance, right? Like Walt mm-hmm. Disney's dead. Of, of course, people are in charge of it now. But if let's just say all of them were to be wiped out instantly, Disney would never, ever, ever like go under anything. It's way too powerful now. It's got mm-hmm. too much control and everything. There's still companies paying to be a part of Disney. It's 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 inevitable. It's impossible for that company to ever, ever die. Not in our reality, not in any reality, unless there's a huge like explosion on the world to wipe out everything. Otherwise, these companies, Apple, Google, Disney, all of these will never, ever die. And um, all the people see that as a scary thing. What do you think? I don't think it's scary. I think it's just... Um... I'm scared that the wrong the wrong ones will survive. Well, what, what, what are, are the wrong ones? What are the wrong ones? The exactly. ones that have the the incorrect values on privacy and the ones that are willing to just sell sell you out. How do you feel about Facebook just out of curiosity? Oh god, I hope Facebook does not have their own singularity. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, I, that, I, would I, I, that would exactly. be the worst that would be the worst package to take ever. <laughs> That's a big contender, oh actually, my. where it's like Holy above I'm your head. I'm so happy like, that you brought that up. Oh my God. <laughs> you were living in Farmville. Oh, for like yeah. million Farmville years. forever. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I've got to make a living. I've got to tend to my crops every 20 minutes. <laughs> and it's sad that I know the people that might opt in for that. No, of course they would. Um, be- the way that people are looking at this, this is why transhumanism and all of this is so interesting. It's because it's still, it's a, it's becoming reality, but it's still so foreign. And because we're getting used to these avatars we're making, we're getting used to these customizations on our phones. Like, okay, when when earlier on in the conversation, like maybe two hours ago, <laughs> you guys mentioned um, cell phones being a part of us. I don't really know if that's true because you're customizing it, but it's still like a thing that can break. It's still a thing that can like cut power. But something like artificial eyes, which get implemented into your brain and use, uses like the electricity from your brain, that defines what a cyborg is. But um, no, but what, what, even what, a cell phone is a tool. Yeah, because, no, because for we example, communicate. Yeah, you're exactly. communicating. You use the calendar as an extension of your memory. It doesn't matter if it um, breaks down because it's being stored in a cloud. It's accessible from anywhere. Yeah. Okay, and like so you're, you're communicating, like, you're texting, and you're phoning us right now with your phone. Right. But we, so it's not a it's not a biological connection. No, it's an work. extension. Wait, you, like a metaphysical yeah. one, then, or you're using it as a way to do something biological. Yeah, but then it's like it's, as the guy was saying before, you could say that with any single tool. So with yeah, we're with getting drawing there. a picture like a self portrait, a self portrait would that be considered making you a cyborg? Because that's how you interpret yourself. That's your avatar, or is it only because this is electronically based that you're that, that that's the consideration? Well, it would have to be electronic for oh. sure. Yeah, it, it has to be like uh, to be a cyborg. It has to be electronic. And it has to be a part of your body. Because so. People if it's or? able if it's able to be stored in the cloud, then that's part of it. Yes, exactly. Right. Okay. Well, I, I think I understand now. Well, but, I, uh, and then I mean, also, so then you would use your cell phone to take a picture of that drawing that you made of yourself to be uploaded to the cloud. No, but let's say this is like back in the 80s when we didn't really have that kind of technology, right? Yeah. Like that's our self-understanding if we were to, to draw a self-portrait. Now, Well, back then uh, that was our understanding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Aga... We've had the super long journey now. Did we? What topics have we not touched upon that's worth touching upon? Oh, I think it was pretty awesome. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. People just need to read and decide for themselves, really. They shouldn't really listen to anybody else because if they don't understand, um, there are li- a lot of good resources that they can get on, get on them and learn the real stuff mm-hmm. instead of talking to people and then get freaked out because those people are freaked out themselves. Yeah, exactly. It's something yeah. that it's not a matter of good or bad. It's going to happen. And it's not like, okay, let's let's stop it in America or let's stop it in Canada because it's just going to be shipped uh, abroad. Yeah. And yeah, um, yeah it was awesome. Uh, what was I, uh, I was going to say actually was, um, it, which actually works with what you just said. Um, the reason why I brought up avatars, I kind of forgot, I guess. Um, I don't have a good perception of my own being. Um, the reason why I brought up avatars is because because transhumanism is becoming a bit of reality now. Um, maybe not yet, but it will be fully realized in the future. Um, because we have these avatars and these personal customizations of what we want, like we want piercings and tattoos, we want to get breast augmentations, we want to get you know, um, lengthen our legs if we're too short for a job. We have so many of these customizable things that... Um, I don't know if we'll reach a, 
a definite kind of um, understanding of this just yet because there's still so many things that people have an interest that um, relate to themselves as opposed to society as a whole. Um, what would you think about that? Would, do you think that would put like a halt on um, transhumanism, even if everybody's becoming accepting of it? Or do you think it'll still arrive and we'll just have to become used to um, whatever it is that escaped our imagination of it? I think it will arrive no matter what. And I think um, a good example of it would be the Paralympics would be more interesting to watch in the next couple of years than Olympics because mm -hmm. of all the you know, artificial limbs that all the athletes would have that are, um, will be functioning much better than uh, humans. The problem at this point, it's not really a problem. It's part of a process that we don't understand a human brain as good as we should. So we can't really uh, add anything to it yet. We understand biology, um, with exception of brain, pretty well. Wouldn't the we Olympics can't... be obsolete in like a thousand yeah, it years? It would be. Yeah, exactly. Why would you need to c compete to see who's better at what when you, can, when you know it's whoever can buy the best parts? Well, it still has to die down, right? It still has to have that process of actually becoming obsolete as opposed to just halting, right? It would be more of like which company can produce the best things exactly well, look at it now like uh, sadly oscar pastores you can't mention his name anymore without the nonsense that's happened with the murder and everything but let's fast let's rewind rather back to like 2012 what before this horrible case happened he performed in the actual olympics and he's got amputated legs so what i got a saying is almost becoming a reality already yeah where there are already um people who are um, impaired already becoming on our level of strength. If not, they'll become even stronger. And it was a huge debate as to whether or not it's actually cheating because he didn't have um, the same problems a lot of people would have when it came to like uh, their muscles or whatever. But at the same time, he had his own problems. But yeah, there like was still muscle that fatigue debate. and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much to be debated here. But you see, like with nanobots in your bloodstream, you can run for like 15 minutes, 30 minutes without even breathing. That will be the oh, new yes. drug. Uh, yeah, exactly. You can lay down in your, it, it, it says in the Transcendent Man documentary, they can just lay down at the bottom of your pool for four hours. Wow. So a lot of oh, things will, right. will be different. Will you guys be willing to share the same server room as me and can hang out for eternity? You got it. I'll yeah, be there. Only we, yeah, keep talking. <laughs> this, that'll be cool. All I'll three bring of my us, new vinyl player. <laughs> yeah, all, all three of us recommend that you do not opt into Facebook's one. So that yeah. would be a living hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't feel like having a billion, you know, invites to playing poker. I'm sorry, I'm, oh my I'm God, not. You, you'd be poked forever. <laughs> Can you imagine that? By everybody in everybody. the world. Everybody. <laughs> oh, man. But you would have a block list. That would be cool. You'd never get to see somebody for the rest of your life ever mm -hmm. again. That's pretty cool. I mean, no, I'm not that kind of person. No, that would suck. I love everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Andreas, where can everyone find you? Well, until I am one with everybody in the future, you could find me for now um, on the basic Twitter at Andreas Babs. And where can everyone find you, Aga? And yeah, I think Twitter, Twitter would be the best. It's at agologist, A-G-O-L-O-G-I-S-T. And you have a website too? I do, agahbahari, A-G-A-H-B-A-H-A-R-I.com. And where would you recommend people to go if they want to learn more? A few websites, name drop them. <laughs> uh, TechCrunch, CruiseWhileAI.net, uh, Popsy.com. Uh, Mashable doing a pretty good job and the technology yeah. section of New York Times. Okay. And cool. New York Times. And if people like Torontonians, where can they go if they want to actually meet up? They can go to meetup.com and search for Toronto Transhumanist Group. And we are meeting up at least once a month. And we're trying to uh, get it to the place that we can actually start recording some talks because some very interesting people are members. Okay. And do you, and help, you help run that too? Or I do. Okay, I that's do. great. And you can, of course, find myself on Twitter at Sean Chin. You can follow this show at Live in Limbo and use the hashtag Capsule Podcast to join in on the conversation. Please subscribe to this show on iTunes. And, of course, you can find the show notes at liveinlimbo.com slash capsule take care have a good one have a good one <laughs>